Good evening, all, and welcome. I hope you're ready for tonight's video of police horror stories. This video has also been graciously sponsored by Studio, and I wanted to share with you the awesome headphones that they sent me. I absolutely love the way they look, feel, sound, and just their design in general. I've been using my pair for over three months now, and I absolutely love them. One thing that I really forgot to talk about before, and really only just noticed quite recently, was the fact that they fold away so neatly and nicely, which makes them really convenient for when traveling around. Another thing I like is that they have these really cool interchangeable caps. So if you ever want to change your style, you just swivel them off and put new ones in. If you would like to get your very own, be sure to head on over to studio.com and punch in the code MORTISMEDIA15 to get a sweet 15% discount at checkout. I know they'll leave you very impressed. Also, please don't forget to share the love and leave this video a big like. But without further ado, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I work in a large inner city district, very poor, with lots of abandoned houses. We get a check the welfare run and two ladies had just gotten home. We were walking up to their house when they hear noises coming from the house just to the west of theirs. They walk over and they claim to hear two kids, a boy and a girl, crying and screaming from the basement of the house. The house is vacant, a fact that the ladies knew. So they claimed they started talking to the kids. The kids are screaming about how scared they are, about how it's dark, and about how they cannot get out. So I get the dispatched run with a backup car. My dispatcher describes all of these creepy elements in the run, and I disregard my backup because I think this is a stupid run, a waste of time, and don't want other officers' time wasted either. I arrive on the scene, and the two ladies are flipping out. These ladies were hysterical, and it made me think perhaps one of their kids had been kidnapped or something. They were so weird. So I got them to calm down, and I had to split them up because they kept feeding into each other's energies, and then they'd all get wired up again. I was forced to ask for backup, which annoyed me to no end because this was still a bullshit run. So they repeated their stories, which matched up more or less perfectly. A common police tactic is to separate people when it comes to a criminal investigation. And it wasn't intentional when I did it this time, but provided a little insight into their honesty. So they were adamant about talking to the children, led me over to the basement window where they had had the conversation, and I just saw a normal little rectangular basement window. They both repeated the conversation they had with the children and said they spoke to them for about five minutes. I listened at the window, nothing. To me, this run is still bullshit. I walk around the other side of the house, not really looking for anything specific, just getting a feel of the place. All the windows are secured, all the doors are locked up, and no one is getting in. At least, not without showing forced entry. I walk back over to the window where the incident took place, and notice one thing in particular. The window is fogged over. There is condensation all over the window. It's summertime, 
And that is a normal thing to see with houses with air conditioning. Except this house either didn't have air conditioning or it wasn't on. As thieves steal the copper coils, so whole houses with air conditioning is rare. And it was the only window with condensation on the whole house. No other basement window, nor any other of the windows on the first or second floor had any. And I made the huge mistake of thinking out loud about this peculiarity with the window. Because the two women flipped their shit again. A lot of, oh lord, and help me Jesus statements were made, and getting thrown about. So at this point, I have a strange looking window, and a house which is locked down tight, privately owned and secured, and I can't make entry without exigent circumstance. But does the claim that the women made constitute such circumstances? This is above my pay grade. So I get a supervisor to come out, which annoyed me even further. He arrives, and I explain to him the situation and he authorizes forced entry. As a quick side note, I loved kicking in doors. It rarely happens, but can be fun and usually quite easy. The front door is heavily secured and it takes about four kicks, but I was able to finally break it down and the city will reimburse the homeowner for the damages. So this house is probably 100 to 120 years old. It's got the mudsy, dirty smell going on. Old wooden floors, plaster walls, very steep stairs and no electricity. I go inside and to be honest, I was a little creeped out. But I don't believe in anything paranormal at all. And I'm 100% skeptic. So I'm expecting either a homeless guy or nothing and it turned out it was nothing. The house was very clean for its age, in the process of being worked on. Drywall stacked on the floor, and it was easy to check every nook and cranny, and there was no signs of anyone being there. I go back outside, advise the house is secure with no one inside, and I'm standing on the street in front of the house talking to my supervisor. We're just bullshitting about whatever, and while standing there, I look over to the house and in the second floor window, which would be about where the front bedroom was, I saw something cross the window. I can't tell you what it was. It was dark and tall, human in shape, adult human, but shadowy or in the shadows. I'm not talking like a slender man type thing. I have no idea what it was. The only unsecured door to the house was still the front door which I kicked in and we were standing 20 feet away from it the whole time. Nothing could have gotten past us and inside. So I take off running back in the house convinced there's a squatter. I bound up the stairs. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And I check everywhere again. There was nowhere to hide and that was it. One evening about eight years ago, it was pouring outside and we got a call from an elderly woman. She called in and said that she was hearing footsteps in her house and she thought there was a ghost inside because she regularly heard the sound of someone walking upstairs. But she lived alone. We went just to check and to make sure that everything was okay. She stayed on the line with 911 because she was frightened. And about three minutes after she initially called, she said that there was actually a man standing outside in her backyard, staring at her through her sliding glass door. Petrified, the woman froze in that spot and continued to stare directly at the man. For the next minute or two, she said that he was just standing there, still as could be, staring at her. And eventually the man slunk off and went out of sight. When we arrived, 
about 12 minutes after the call first came. We went to the front door. I remained in the foyer with the woman and the other police officer, went to the backyard to see if the man was still hiding out there, or if there were any traces of him. And I spoke with her for several minutes, until the other officers returned. He said there was no trace of anyone having been in the backyard. We set off to do a quick sweep before we go left to make sure the house was all clear. In her living room, the room that has the sliding glass door, we discovered a trail of mud and footprints inside the house. I asked the woman if she had been outside at all that day, or if anyone had been over to visit her. She said no, that she lived alone and that no one had come by to visit. The woman was pretty old, and had very poor eyesight and was hard of hearing, as elderly people tend to be. This woman obviously had seen the man's reflection, and mistakenly thought he was in front of her, in her backyard. But in reality, he had been standing only a few feet away from her in the same room, while she'd been talking to 911. Nothing was stolen, broken or out of place, so we don't know what his intentions were. Who knows what would have happened if she'd have not stayed on the line with the operator. I know it sounds like something out of a campfire story, but it was honestly one of the most unnerving and creepy experiences I have ever had whilst on duty. My dad spent his whole career as a copper, and is the stereotypical, straightforward bloke, who has very little time for anything that you might label as paranormal. That being said, he describes one event from about 20 years ago that he still cannot explain. One late afternoon in autumn, he was patrolling with a colleague in Newbury of Berkshire, UK, when they were radioed and asked to check out reports of a fight on the rural outskirts of town. Apparently sounds of an altercation had been heard coming from a field, of all places, and locals were concerned, but hadn't been able to describe or give any more information. When they got to the field in question, my dad and his colleague hopped the fence and headed inwards, not immediately seeing or hearing anything. It was gloomy and a little misty at ground level, but apparently just about enough light was left in the day in order for them to see that obviously no one was about. Apparently, they gave the field a sweep and were on their way back to the car when, as my dad describes it, everything went mental. Shouting, screaming, and all the sounds of an almighty fight completely surrounded him. Even though he was stood in an empty field, apart from his colleague. He says three things in particular stuck with him. Firstly, he wasn't scared shitless at the time, just very confused. Secondly, the look on his colleague's face that basically said, are you hearing this too? Then finally, after a short time, the sound just stopped and they made their way back to the car, called in and said that nothing was going on. When pushed, he admits it felt like he was in the middle of something significant and that he thinks he felt and not just heard the fight around him. And with hindsight, he was more frightened after the event than at the time. He would never describe this as paranormal himself. But to me, this has always sounded like a replay type event that people talk about. And subsequently, learning about the civil war history of the specific area in question backs this up, for me anyway. 
and I've not heard of other accounts of similar stories from the area, but I haven't looked that hard to be honest. I am stationed in Japan, with my wife back in the States. I typically say goodnight to her at about noon Japan time. And one afternoon, my phone rang with her number at about four, the middle of the night for her. Hey honey, what are you doing up? Her voice was shaky, a forced whisper in near panic. There's someone in the house. My heart instantly started pounding, my hands shaking. I had to fight back the urge to projectile vomit. I'd felt adrenaline before, in a former career as a paramedic, and getting in car accidents and such. But this was the single worst moment of my life. From a mundane afternoon at work, to realizing the single thing most precious in my life might be in grave danger. And I'm out on the other side of the planet, totally helpless. Grab your work phone, get in the closet, lock the door and call 911. Stay on the phone with me. The longest, most terrifying six minutes of my life passed as we waited together for the police to show up listening to her stifled sobs. I could hear in her voice that she was physically shaking with fear. In the background, I heard noises, like someone was banging doors or cabinets. My emotional roller coaster went from blind rage to despair and then back again parabolically for about 30 times before finally the sound of an officer's voice in her bedroom said that it was okay for her to come out and a tsunami of relief washed over me. I teared up. I was so happy. I was laughing and crying and just relieved of how beautiful life is and how much I love my wife. How amazing it is to know that she was safe. And in the background, I could hear the officer. Ma'am, the door to your garage was ajar when we entered. Did you close and lock it? Yes, I definitely did. My heart rate started elevating again. Suddenly in the background, the cop said, Jim, what the hell was that? Ma'am, stay here. She was giving me a play by play of the cops pulling their weapons and quickly clearing the house again. This being a small town, she said that there were probably five cops there. She said the same banging noises started up again when the cops started talking to her. And the noise continued while they cleared the house. At this point, she said they were clearly getting pretty freaked out and she was getting worked up by it too. With the house cleared a second time and the cops unable to pinpoint the sound, they went outside to continue the search. My wife went out into the driveway after them and watched as they entered the house next door, which was a brownstone that shared a common wall with our house. Weapons drawn, flashlights up, and probably the entire police force of this small town breached and cleared the unfinished home under construction. After about a minute, she said they all came out laughing there was a piece of plywood leaning against the common wall. And as it was at a precarious angle, it was being blown by the wind. Apparently it was being blown in such a way, it would come off the wall and slam back down again. To my sleeping wife next to an open window, it sounded like someone was trying to break in. The garage door opened mysteriously several more times until we figured out that it didn't close and lock all the way due to the weather stripping. We still laugh about this day, but shit, that was scary. Even the cops were freaked out by it. I was in the Navy and my command's headquarters were in an old World War II hospital. 
there is an extensive basement that is used as a gym and storage area. There are some cages with gear in them on the storage side and the other side is locker rooms for the gym, complete with showers. The male showers are the old autopsy rooms because it was the only room with a drain. Apparently, there is a headless nurse that haunts the building. It's not one of those blatant poltergeists that scares the crap out of you, but one of those ghosts that just does really subtle stuff, like you're not even sure if you've seen it or not, with one exception. There's a story of one time that a sailor was in the gym later at night, after everyone had gone home for the day. He got his PT in, then went to take a shower in the former autopsy room. As he was showering, after rinsing the shampoo out of his hair and opening his eyes, he noticed that the water around the drain was reddish and he assumed it was dirt, as dirt in the region is red and these are old pipes. He finished his shower and then took a second look. It was way too red to be dirt, definitely blood. That was pretty weird, but he knew it was an old autopsy room and figured it was just old World War II blood and dismissed it. He got dressed and left the locker room. On his way to the stairs, he noticed the light in the hallway towards the storage area and former morgue had been left on. Not surprising. Sailors can be forgetful. So he went to turn it off rather than bother the watchstanders with it. When he went to turn it off, he heard a noise further down the hall. It sounded to him like the door to the outside, which was around the corner, which could mean that this was an intruder. So he walked to the corner and looked. Someone dressed in a simple white dress was hunched over an old style gurney with a body bag on it, pushing it towards the door. As he looked, it stopped, released the gurney and turned to face him. She hadn't been hunched over. She just had no head. He noped out of there, went straight up the stairs to the quarter deck, aka the lobby, and he tried to tell the sailors on watch what he'd seen, but he was mostly a babbling mess. They called the chaplain, and he took the guy somewhere off to talk because he had no interest in going back into the building. Once he calmed down and he was rational again, he told this whole story. When people at the compound found out some scary shit had happened to him, he told them all this story. Supposedly the guy was so traumatized that he couldn't work in the building anymore and they had to send him home for psychiatric reasons. There is now a time limit for which you can use the gym for PT. Although I don't know if it's official. I just know that nobody uses that gym after normal working hours anymore. Oh yeah. And as a junior enlisted, I got to be the roving security watch on the graveyard shift and had to do solo rounds of the building after midnight. I took a flashlight every time but it didn't make me feel much better about it. We got a call of trespassers at an abandoned hospital during the daytime. There was on-site security who kept it secure even though it was shut down. They swore they heard footsteps and talking on the second floor over the past few days. They locked down the entire perimeter 
and called us out there. There was no way out. We went in there with six officers and started from the seventh floor and systematically checked every single room down to the bottom floor. There was no power, so we were lucky that it was still daylight and there were lots of windows. It was an older hospital, so they left old CRT monitors from the 80s and 90s in there. It was pretty eerie and reminded me a lot of the first scenes from The Walking Dead. We cleared down from floor seven to five, no problem. And once we hit the fourth floor, it started getting weird. This was the hospital's storage area. Instead of the big spacious rooms, it was super cramped and had cinder block walls. There were chain link cages all over the place with old locks on them. And it seriously looked like a horror movie prison area where they locked up all their victims. It was also pitch black. The hospital was so big that we worked in two man groups on each floor, but naturally split up as the floors opened up more. The third floor was a mental ward area. So the padded walls and pitch dark rooms started to get me a little nervous. The second floor was by far the worst, the surgery ward. There were no windows against it and it was pitch black and there were large eerie operating rooms all over. In the middle of some of the rooms were large metal slabs where they would operate people on. In adjoining rooms, they had huge pegboards where they stored all the surgery power tools. How did I know it was power tools? They had marked out the outlines of various drills, saws, and other painful looking devices. It was kind of freaky thinking about how many people had died in those rooms when they couldn't save them. I was definitely nervous cleaning those rooms solo in pitch black with only a flashlight. We eventually cleared every room on every floor and found nothing. The security guards swore me up and down. They always heard talking and footsteps down the hall throughout. We pretty much swore off that place and said not to call us anymore. It was a few years back, about 2009. It was night shift, just a regular night. And my partner and I were conducting a walking patrol of this old crematorium that they turned into something or other. Well, this thing was huge. It took us about an hour and a half to walk through every room. Officer Jay and I split up. I had forgotten my flashlight at home and was using my backup from my bag. You know, the kind that's about 38 feet long and takes 200 D batteries. The ridiculously low lumen yellow tinted baton with a bulb on the end. So I'm walking through the third floor or so when this stupid flashlight decides that the batteries just aren't doing it for it anymore and it drops to 30% beam. I can't see a thing. I've only walked through once or twice before and I decide, screw it. I throw the old moon beam onto my belt and try to feel my way to the staircase. There are so many hallways, I miss my turn. And at this point I'm lost and I refuse to go over the net and admit it. I start keying my mic, chirping rapidly, trying to get Officer Jay's attention. I've heard all the stories about the long hallway and the man standing at the end of it. And I find myself walking downstairs when I come to what sounds like by my footsteps, a long hallway. Now, I don't personally believe in ghosts. 
I feel that you have to have some sort of religious beliefs in order to do so. And I have my left hand on the wall and my right on my pistol. I'd given up on keying my mic because I felt I wasn't close to the exit. I thought I'd seen movement in front of me and I drew my weapon and stopped in silence. I continued to walk with my boots and called out, Officer J? No answer. I'm drawn and I still get no answer. And I continued to walk and the wall to my left disappeared. And finally I see light from the moon. There was a room with the window on the ground floor. I just climbed out of the window, so I was done here. So I walked into the room and it got much colder. I walked to the window and a blast comes out of my radio. It had turned all the way up so Officer J could hear all my chirps. So a blast comes out the radio and it's J. We've got a jumper, side Charlie. Facing the front door is Alpha, Bravo on the left, Charlie in the rear and Delta in the right. I scramble out the window and eat shit on my way out. The belt caught its way out. I face plant and there was no putting my hands out to soften the blow once the belt was trying to set myself free. The other stuck behind me as I fell. Time is often of the essence. I hit the ground running and it takes 0.5 seconds for me to get my bearings. I'm on the Alpha Delta corner and I start running as hard as I can and I hear Jay screaming at this guy not to do it as he has his mic keyed in so I can hear it from ways off and in my ear. I make it round the corner and Jay screamed no and turned away from the building. I looked but saw no one. There was a panic. I let out a breath and I don't remember babbling, but I'm sure it sounded like, where's the jumper? Jay said, he jumped. I couldn't stop him. But I said, bro, I don't see anyone. We looked, looked and looked around some more and there wasn't anyone there. There never was. Jay was seeing something. I was patrolling some older neighborhoods. It was around 2 a.m. And I turned a corner and there's a girl curled up in the fetal position, screaming bloody murder in the middle of the road. I get out, assuming it's a demonic issue. Her female friend is frantically running around as well. By now, every hair on my neck is straight up expecting that I'm about to get into a confrontation with whoever created this mess. I make my way to the house and there were more people inside. Everyone is flipping out. No attention to surroundings, just walking around a weird daze. And after all was said and done, I learnt that they were using a Ouija board and some weird things went down that tripped everybody out. I just happened to come across the math afterwards. Their second was an old woman who reported someone had broken into her home and was hiding in the closet. Upon arrival, it was clear she was not all quite there. We searched the house and came up empty, but she was insistent that he was in one of the particular closets. Not missing a beat, my partner pulls out a pair of handcuffs and goes on to pretend to arrest the person from the closet. He then escorted the person out of the house and she was literally completely satisfied from it. We then contacted family to come and stay with her and get her some help. The last thing is a few of us were on a night out and got this wild hair about ghost hunting. So naturally we started with cemeteries. We would leave a digital recorder in the middle of one and retrieve it a couple of hours later when it got slower. Around 4 a.m. we would then spend from 4 to 6 a.m. writing reports and listening to the recorder. 
There were certainly some odd sounds from what would come across from it from time to time, but nothing ever too bad. Just tapping and crunching noises. The funniest story from this is that one of the guys was super into it. One really slow night, he decided to go take pictures in a smaller cemetery at the witching hour, hoping to catch something strange. A few minutes into it, the desk sergeant comes over the radio, requesting whoever was at X cemetery to report in. He did. The sergeant had filed a phone call from a citizen, wondering why there was a cop in the cemetery taking pictures at 3am. The sergeant was on it and promptly told her that there had been recent vandalism and that he was probably documenting it. She was happy with that. But the sergeant's what the hell are you doing face to the officer was fantastic. We then had to disclose what he'd been up to. And we were obviously told to stop. One cold October night, we got a call to assist the sheriff's office on a burglary in progress out in the country. Because our radios couldn't talk to the country roads, the country dispatch telephoned our dispatch, and our dispatch radio relayed the info to us. We basically had no info and didn't know where we were going, and I had a lonely, eerie, creepy feeling in my bones while driving at crazy speeds to help the family. It took us about 25 minutes to arrive on the scene. The house was dark, and it turned out the suspect had cut the power line days before and had been living in the house while the family of four was on vacation. Walking through the yard to the front door, I could hear the man yelling, get out of my house, please. I walked in and found an obviously mentally handicapped young man, dirty, bearded, wide eyes calmly almost whispering. I was sent. I'm supposed to be here, this is the place. He didn't respond to verbal commands, but he also didn't resist at all when we put handcuffs on him. It was like he was looking through me while I was questioning him and searching his backpack. In all honesty, I was freaked out, even though he was significantly bigger than me. It was just unsettling. I didn't even want to pick the guy and put him in the back of my car. I didn't want to have to drive back that tricky bastard. His backpack was full of miscellaneous items, a notebook drawn of monsters and rambling writings, a hunting knife, clothes that couldn't have been his, and mail from different addresses and names, kids' school maths books, as well as other stuff. It was just weird. And eventually, a county deputy arrived and took him away. And I never heard anything more about it. This reminded me of another time. I was very new and ended up having to babysit a TDO while waiting for mental health services to arrive. It was just he and I in this tiny interrogation room. He was bearded, dirty, erratic, and his eyes were creepy. He gave me the creep vibes. And whenever I would ask him a question like, Nice night, huh? He would respond by fidgeting, looking up into an area in the corner of the room, nodding and mumbling before looking at me and answering the question. It was like he was getting his orders from an invisible demon in the corner. My grandfather was a police officer back in the day. He worked murder cases and did detective work in his later career. But this late night, he was responding to a call of suspected shots fired at an old abandoned house. My grandpa tells the story something like this. He and his partner are the closest to the house of everyone who received the dispatch call. So, they made it there 
first. When they reached the house, they found the gate through the backyard forced open. So they followed through. It was a shots fired, so they had their weapons drawn. As they approached the house, there was one unarmed man attempting to enter. The house was locked, and the man fled while my grandpa's partner chased after him. Here's the creepy part. My grandpa looks through the windows of the house, thinking that maybe the guy was trying to get to someone on the inside. When he looks in, he vaguely sees someone standing and looking directly at him. My grandpa raises his pistol and says, Police, don't move! Simultaneously, the man inside appeared to also raise his pistol. My grandpa says, Now, I have never had someone draw his weapon on me. And I began to think, what if I don't shoot before he does? And the adrenaline was pumping. So he says, Drop the weapon or I'll be forced to shoot. And the man stays still. Ridiculously still. My grandpa takes cover on the right side of the window and radios in for his partner, who has lost the man on foot. Before his partner returned, he pops back out from the right to try and advance, expecting the man to have gone away and found a hiding place. So with his weapon drawn, he jumps out and looks inside. But when he looks into the window with his weapon drawn, there is the man, still hazy, dark, and pointing his weapon directly at him. It's silent for what seems like forever, and my grandpa shouts again to drop the weapon and to get onto the ground. With adrenaline pumping, my grandpa says that at this point, he begins to believe it's a ghost, because of how still it was being. Then he sees the assailant is wearing a badge. This freaked me out, he said. Had my partner made it inside and was playing with me? Was this man impersonating an officer? Once more, he said, drop your weapon and get on the ground. The ghost also motioned with his pistol. And at this point in the story, my grandpa says it best. It was a cotton picking mirror. I got myself worked up over my own damn reflection. And that is the story of how my grandpa almost crapped himself over his own reflection. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's spooky police videos. Please remember that if you'd like to pick up your very own studio headphones to punch in your sweet 15% discount code Mortis Media 15, as it will go a long way saving you a pretty penny. If you did enjoy the video, please remember to drop that like, leave a comment, subscribe and hit the bell icon to not miss what I post, as I publish a video daily. But anyway, for now guys I'm gonna sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.